Okay, you're live. Okay, well, um, thanks, Yusuf. Uh, Dr. B here uh, on another beautiful sunny day here in Toronto. Um, we're missing Eric. He's uh, He's got some obligations. Um, so uh, Yusuf is filling in and going to help uh, man the chat line. Um, I actually can't see the chat line, so um, but I will be asking you questions, and Yusuf is uh, great at, uh, at helping me there. Um, so today, um, what I'm going to do is I'm going to share my screen here as usual. And um, I would like to um, review... Uh, um, uh, well, today what we're going to talk about is uh, sciatica, but before we get into that, I'd really like to address the, a question that came up last week um, in our discussion of magic, magic bullet exercises. And uh, this is the issue of hanging from a bar. And, you know, I'd never heard about this. Um, we did a rotator cuff session, and that's the first time I'd kind of heard about hanging from a bar. And... Um, uh, I was very curious. So I actually went and I bought Dr. Kirsch's book. Dr. Kirsch is an orthopedic surgeon. Uh, he's in Wisconsin. And he wrote this book um, called uh, Shoulder Pain, The Solution and Prevention, uh, The Exercise That Heals the Shoulder and Relieves Back Pain. So uh, there may actually be some application of this uh, for our later discussion on uh, sciatica. And um, we were, we were, I was getting questions about whether or not hanging could actually lead to a remodeling of the acromion. And so Dr. Kirsch, uh, he's got an interesting story. He, um, he himself developed shoulder pain. And um, when we first started doing arthroscopy, we actually would sit and we had to look through the end of the camera, just kind of like a pirate would be looking <laughs> through the periscope. And we would often have our arms up in um, challenging positions for long periods of time while we were working. And he was doing a lot of arthroscopy and he um, attributed this to developing pain in his shoulder. And one day he was playing with his son in the park and he started to hang from the monkey bars and he realized that he that really made his pain worse uh, initially. Uh, but he got uh, thinking about hanging and what maybe this would do um, to stretch the shoulder structures and to potentially alleviate his symptoms. And um, he, he believed that um, hanging would uh, lead to remodeling of the soft tissue and bone around the shoulder that would fix your shoulder pain. Now let's look at this little picture here for uh, reference. On the left, the uh, picture here is of the side of the shoulder blade uh, or the scapula. And the, humor, the humerus has been removed and the soft tissue has been removed except for this coracochromial ligament. So this is the glenoid. This is where the shoulder um, humeral head would articulate with the shoulder blade. This is the acromion. And underneath the acromion and the coracochromial, coracochromial ligament is what we call the supraspinatus outlet. And this is where the muscle and the tendon uh, part of that rotator cuff comes through and inserts onto the humeral head. And I'm gonna refer you to um, a rotator cuff shoulder session that we did a few weeks ago. And Yusuf has put the link into uh, the chat uh, for us today, um, where we discuss the, this concept of supraspinatus outlet size and the role that this may play on impinging or um, pressing on the rotator cuff tendon. So Dr. Kirsch believes that over time, the supraspinatus outlet will decrease in size. And you can see here that there's a change in shape of the acromion. The acromion has become a little more hooked at the front and that um, there is contracture or shortening of the coracochromial ligament, which leads to a decrease in space for where that muscle and tendon is traveling and predisposes to impingement or wear on the tendon, which can eventually cause pain, inflammation, and um, possibly wearing of the tendon itself. And I believe all of this. I think that uh, so far, Dr. Kirsch and I are in complete agreement with uh, everything that there, a decreased size of the uh, supraspinatus outlet is important. Um, however, um, Sorry, I just want to 
Uh, however, I don't believe that the supraspinatus outlet is only influenced by the shape of the acromion and the coracoacromial ligament. And I'll expand on that in a moment. Um, so he has a theory that before hanging, you've got a very small supraspinatus outlet. So here we've got the scapula. Here we have the humeral uh, shaft and the humeral head. And you can see the tendon of the supraspinatus that is coming out underneath that coracochromial arch. And here is the uh, tendon that's irritated. So before hanging, we have this hooked acromion and then after hanging, the acromion is going to change shape and there's going to be lengthening of the coracoacromial ligament. So his um, feeling, and this is a CT scan of a, uh, this is these pictures are from his book actually. Um, and um, with, he's done a simulated hanging situation by applying a weight to someone's arm while they're lying in a CT scan scanner and his, um, theory is that the humerus pressing against the acromion is going to lead to remodeling of the acromion. And this follows Wolf's law. And Wolf's law basically says that when you apply stress to the tissue, the tissue will remodel and change in response to the way that the force is applied. So I don't disagree with that. Um, but I think that it would take a very, very long period of time for this remodeling of the acromion to occur. And uh, very often when I read the, um, the responses um, of people on the internet, they say, oh, within a day, within two days, my shoulder pain is completely relieved. Uh, I do not believe that that has happened as a result of a chromial remodeling. I do believe that uh, when someone is hanging and you can see that um, this woman is hanging and she's got her feet uh, just against a, a ladder here, um, that her lats are going to be stretched, that the pecs are going to be stretched, that the capsule of the shoulder that connects the glenoid and the humerus are going to be stretched, and that stretching that tissue could relieve some of your pain. And this is a, a picture um, that demonstrates um, when you are in the overhead position, the coracobrachialis and pectoralis minor that both insert onto the front of your shoulder blade, onto that coracoid process, um, are in a lengthened position. And there's actually a connection from the pelvis all the way up to your hand when you're in a hanging position. And I believe personally that this is probably the benefit of uh, hanging is that you stretch the pec minor, you stretch the coracobrachialis, and those muscles, when they become short because of repetitive movements, cause the scapula to tilt forward. And that has a significant effect on decreasing the subacromial space. Also, the posterior capsule, so the cat and the inferior capsule that is underneath the, the shoulder, so under here, would be stretched by hanging. So I do think that hanging can lead to some relaxation or stretching of the soft tissues around the shoulder in the short term. That if you hung from this bar for 15 minutes for years that you possibly could remodel your acromion, but I don't believe that that's gonna happen within days. Um, and you know, Dr. Kirsch, I, I'd never actually heard of this before. And you know, I'm a shoulder surgeon, a shoulder specialist. And um, every, month or so I go on the internet and I do a PubMed search looking for new concepts and new ideas about how to treat shoulder issues. And Dr. Kirsch has never come up. And I think that the reason for this is that he's never actually studied it in a scientific way. So he's got a lot of very positive um, results, um, but I think that there's a couple of reasons that he does. Um, one, not only does Dr. Kirsch recommend that you hang, he also recommends that you strengthen your rotator cuff. And I would wholeheartedly agree with this. In the literature, if we look at people's response to rotator cuff um, strengthening exercises, they've got a 90% chance of improving and getting better. So because Dr. Kirsch has not kind of broken things down and done CT scans of people before they ha have been hanging, 
and then say six months or a year or two years after they've been hanging to prove that the acromion remodels, um, he hasn't teased out whether it's the exercises alone that are causing the improvement in the person's pain or the hanging that is doing it. Um, my belief is that it's the combination because Dr. Kirsch and I actually have very similar beliefs that um, you need to um, lengthen the tissues to rebalance the shoulder and then you need to activate the correct muscles in order to restore the foundation for movement. But um, we're coming at it from slightly different ways. Um, I believe more in the active self myofascial release end range expansion and dissociation techniques to restore your foundation for movement. And um, I think that they're a little safer for people who may have pathology in their shoulder uh, because it's more controlled. Um, but I don't think that if you, you know, if you've got uh, relatively new shoulder pain, if you're young, your tissues are pretty healthy and that you feel a little bit of tightness and stiffness in your shoulder, I don't think that hanging is going to cause any problems and may actually stretch the right uh, part of your shoulder uh, to help you out. Um, Dr. Kirsch himself says that you have to be able to lift your arm up to at least 90. Uh, and I do think that he's correct that the rotator cuff really isn't in danger if you've got a really stiff shoulder. I, I have seen some people with adhesive capsulitis or a frozen shoulder associated with a rotator cuff tear who have their shoulder forcefully moved around and they actually regain range of motion through the rotator cuff and they tear the rotator cuff more versus um, achieving the goal of stretching the capsule. Um, but I don't think that there's terrible danger in hanging um, for the rotator cuff. Uh, having said all of this, um, you know, there's massive numbers of success stories on the internet and very unusually, there's not one negative comment. And I, I don't know why that is. I mean, I, I think this is unusual. You know, most things people have one negative thing to say. Um, so overall, um, I don't think it's a magic bullet because if you just hang and you just stretch the tissues, if you don't address why your shoulder and those tissues became tight in the first place, they're just gonna keep getting tight. So you have to keep hanging over and over and over. Um, so really the key is to rebalance tissues uh, and then activate the correct muscles. Um, I, I think the jury is out for me still. Am I, am I going to actually recommend hanging to my patients as a treatment? Um, probably not unless they bring it up to me and then we will discuss the role that it could play. Um, but I think it's a really interesting, uh, re really interesting concept and um, would love to hear more from you in the chat if you have any experience um, and we can address it during our Q&A uh, later on. So that is the, uh, the wrap on the magic bullet uh, of, uh, and the story of hanging. Um, so today, what I wanted to talk about is sciatica. Uh, and this is just a, if anybody's experienced it, you know, let us know in the chat if you are experiencing sciatica right now or have had it in the past. And it's really kind of a horrific and very painful condition. And we're going to go through our usual uh, review of what the normal anatomy is, what the degenerative process is, what actual, uh, what sciatica is, um, and what the role of disc herniation plays in causing sciatica, and what we can do if we have sciatica, and finally, what the role for surgery may or may not be. So when we look at the lumbar spine, so that's our lower back area, uh, it is made up of alternating units of uh, bone and a disc. And we refer to uh, two of the vertebral bodies with the intervening disc as uh, a motion segment. So we've got the vertebral body, this is the front of the spine. So this is where your belly button would be. And then we have the spinous processes at the back. If you were to feel onto your back, the little bumps that you feel in the center between the muscles are the spinous processes. And then we have these little facet joints, which are like our knuckles. Um, that allow our spine to move into flexion, extension, and rotation. And the spinal cord itself is sitting between the posterior or the back of the vertebral body in the disc and the um, arch that's created by the, uh, the spinous processes and the pedicles here. And we'll see that a little better in a moment. Um, 
The disc itself has a very interesting structure. It's um, got a thick, tough outer um, tissue known as the um, annulus fibrosis. And this is made of collagen fibrils, which um, are really, really strong and a central more spongy or gelatinous um, portion, which is called the nucleus pulposa. And uh, it, it reminds me of uh, a car tire where you've got the very thick rubber, which would be the annulus fibrosis on the outside. And then you have the inner tube, which compresses and um, uh, has the air in it, um, which would represent the nucle uh, nucleus uh, pulposa. Now, one of the most interesting features of the disc is that it doesn't have a good blood supply. So if you, any tissue that doesn't have a good blood supply, if it is injured, uh, will uh, heal at a slower rate, if at all. And um, so it's important that we do take care of our discs, uh, but the good news is, is our discs are made to be loaded. They are made to be compressed uh, and support our body weight. And the final little point here with the circle concept is that what, go, what goes on at the front of the, the spine affects the back and vice versa. So you can imagine we've got a normal disc height here between the two vertebral bodies. If the disc material deteriorates or extrudes out into the spinal canal, that disc height will be lost and the disc will shorten in height. So the effect of that is important because with a change in the height of the uh, disc space, you're going to affect the way that this little facet joint at the back of the spine is loaded. And it can have a deleterious effect by uh, asymmetrically loading the articular cartilage in the facets and lead to arthritis in your facet joints. So we want to try to protect our discs um, as much as possible. Now the discs tend to be loaded more into flexion. So when you bend forward, um, you really increase the pressure on the disc significantly uh, versus extension, you, we tend to load our facet joints. So um, discs, when we look at them, um, and if you've been to any of my talks before, we often show the analogy of a wear and tear of a, a rope with the fraying of the rope. Well, the wear and tear that goes on um, in a disc can, um, is seen in this picture here. So on the far left, we've got the normal disc where we've got the annulus um, uh, surrounding the nucleus pulposa. And uh, over time, what can happen is that the annulus can become thinner, that we know that the little collagen fibers within the disc may break down with normal wear and tear. And then our body has to go in and has to repair the collagen fibrils uh, but because there's not a good blood supply to the disc, this takes quite a bit of time. So if you are overloading your disc and you create too much breakdown, you can get into that uh, sort of dangerous area where your breakdown is greater than your repair so that you eventually start having uh, the inner softer disc material protruding into the annulus itself. And eventually, if you get a complete tear in the annulus, the disc material can extrude out and into the area of the spinal canal uh, and the area where the nerve roots are. So um, a sequestered disc is when the material actually goes out into the spinal canal and actually is no longer connected. It's free out in the canal versus uh, a disc that's extruded the disc material is still sort of connected to the, the disc itself. So um, disc herniations, we're looking now at the back of the spine. So that you can see here, this is the body and this is the lower spinal area. We have the vertebral bodies, the disc spaces. These little circles are the pedicles or the bone that comes towards the back to form the arch around the spinal um, cord and the cauda equina. And um, what happens is that at the end of our, our, when our spinal cord ends, it becomes the cauda equina, which is all of these little nerve roots. And the nerve roots then exit the area underneath the pedicle. And then they go out to form peripheral nerves, which then supply our muscles and our organs uh, so that um, we can walk and do things. 
So we have the L4 vertebral body and underneath it, we have the L4 nerve root. Then we have the, <clears throat> excuse me, the L5 vertebrae, <clears throat> excuse me. Uh, so the L4, 5 disc space, um, as seen here, there's a little bulge and you can imagine if the disc material herniated out into this area, it will put pressure either on the L5 nerve root if the herniation is more central. And sometimes we see these herniations more laterally so that the L4 uh, nerve root can be affected. <clears throat> Excuse me. So when a disc herniates, it can cause sciatica. Now sciatica isn't really a diagnosis of a disc herniation per se. A sciatica is a constellation of symptoms which uh, consists of pain in the leg, particularly down the back of the leg, going all the way into the foot. The pain um, is, is really severe in the leg and you may not even have any pain in your back at all. Uh, the pain is aggravated by uh, things that increase abdominal pressure. So coughing, sneezing, um, doing a Valsalva maneuver, um, flex, uh, anything that will increase the pressure on the disc. So we mentioned earlier that flexion increases the force on the disc. So bending forward, anything that um, loads the disc can create um, pain down the leg. And anything that puts stretch on the sciatic nerve, you can see that the nerve roots come out of the lumbar spine. They join together uh, to create the sciatic nerve. And that travels from your buttock down the back of your leg between your hamstring muscles, and then uh, branches to supply the muscles in your calf and your foot. So we commonly see uh, or feel, would feel pain at the, in the, the thigh, uh, in, in the buttock, the thigh, and in the foot. Um, there may be associated numbness because uh, the nerve root itself carries the sensory fibers uh, within it. So there'll be very specific loss of sensation uh, depending on what part of the, the nerve has been affected. And really the key thing, if you have sciatica, you really should go to the doctor, um, almost no matter what. Um, and and I, the reason for this is uh, it's so painful. A, uh, I think that it's important that you make sure that you don't have any weakness or um, loss of uh, muscle function because of pressure on the nerve root. Um, you may have reflex changes. Uh, so we test your knee, your knee jerk and your ankle jerk. And we commonly see these lost when you have a disc herniation. Um, that doesn't um, worry me. I mean, it's concerning, of course, that you've had a disc herniation. Um, and sensory changes don't worry me to the same degree as actual paralysis of your, your limb. And um, certainly, uh, I haven't got it up here, but we'll talk about it um, when we talk about surgery. If you have any effect of the disc on the nerve roots that affect your bowel or bladder function, that is a surgical emergency. So you should go to the doctor to have an examination to figure out exactly what part of the nerve is affected is there any uh, actual reflex change, weakness, or sensory loss? Um, and what's the range of motion like in your back uh, and in your leg? Um, very often, the back itself is pretty good. You may, however, have muscle spasm in the area um, in certain situations, uh, which can be very painful in your spine as well. So go to the doctor and, and get checked. Um, most of the time people get better um, within about six weeks. And um, if you're not getting better in the usual fashion, um, then your doctor also needs to be asking you questions about other potential causes um, for sciatica and pain uh, affecting the sciatic nerve. And you can see on the left here, this is um, the pelvis and you can see the nerve roots actually come out the front of the, the spine, but then they go down the back of the leg. And there are um, the ovaries, uh, the uterus and for women are close by. So if you've got a cyst of the ovary or uh, if you've got endometriosis, uh, these are a couple of conditions that can uh, affect um, women uh, that can apply pressure to the sciatic nerve. And certainly during pregnancy, um, if when the baby gets large enough, if um, the, based on the shape of your uterus, the, the way the baby is lying, you could end up with pressure on the sciatic nerve, which uh, really isn't fun at all. 
Um, the ureters, this is the connection between the kidney and the bladder, can also create um, issues uh, with the sciatic, but, uh, sciatic nerve, but it's very rare. And probably more commonly, um, instead of just a, an acute disc herniation, you could have nerve type pain associated with back pain in this situation when um, you have some arthritis that has evolved over time in your back. And you can see at the top of this uh, picture, the our degenerative changes are not as severe as they are at the bottom. So at the top, we have a relatively normal disc. Then as the disc starts to degenerate and the space between the vertebral bodies diminishes, uh, and if there's possibly with some disc herniation, um, this, this foramen, this is where the nerve root leaves the spinal canal. You can see how it gets smaller and smaller over time. So that spurs that are associated with facet joint arthritis and spurs that are associated with loss of the normal disc height will make this space smaller, similar to how the supraspinatus outlet was smaller with acromial spurs. Um, these these changes can lead to uh, a change in size on the nerve root and um, put pressure on the nerve root, which can create symptoms down the leg. And I think one of the most diff uh, important differentiating factors between an acute disc herniation and sciatica versus leg pain with uh, chronic degenerative conditions is that with the uh, acute situation, the pain is usually more severe, it happens in an instant, you make the wrong move and um, the disc herniates, the nerve is compressed and the nerve doesn't have an opportunity to adapt. So there's often uh, a higher chance of having loss of function with an acute disc herniation versus the more slowly, uh, slow and chronic uh, pressure on the nerve, which is kind of like a boa constrictor, slowly putting compression on the nerve, the nerve has a chance to adapt so that there isn't uh, necessarily any uh, findings of paralysis or loss of reflex. Um, however, uh, it's important to note uh, so that you can make adjustments in your treatment. A very common uh, syndrome that masquerades as sciatica is what is known as piriformis syndrome. The piriformis is one of the small uh, muscles in the buttock. This is um, the back of the hip. We've got our sacrum. This is the pelvis. This is the acetabulum or the socket of the hip joint. And the piriformis is a muscle that uh, it helps to stabilize the hip joint. And if you guys saw Eric's, uh, one of Eric's uh, videos uh, in the past, I think it was last week, um, looking at the little rotators around the hip and how important they are in keeping the femoral head centered on the acetabulum. Uh, the piriformis is one of these little muscles and often the piriformis becomes too tight and short when all those other little muscles aren't working properly uh, because the piriformis then has to do their job. So you can see that the sciatic nerve comes out from the um, vertebral neural foramen and it sits underneath the piriformis muscle between um, between the bone and the muscle. So you could imagine if we're, this is a the little circle here and it's showing you a side view of how the nerve could be compressed if you took the piriformis muscle and made it really tight and that decreased the space for the nerve to travel, then you're going to put pressure on the nerve, the nerve isn't gonna like it and you're gonna feel pain and sciatic type symptoms in your leg. I find that um, the sciatica associated with piriformis syndrome, uh, generally the pain is more localized to the buttock and the thigh. Uh, it's often very challenging to sit for long periods of time. Occasionally you can get numbness and tingling um, in the foot and the thigh, but it's not quite as dramatic as if there's a nerve root compression from a disc herniation. And I often find that people who suffer from uh, piriformis syndrome have SI joint issues where the SI joint gets very ever so slightly, literally one or two degrees off and stuck in the wrong position. And um, in our, our um, discuss, we, we did a presentation uh, on back pain and discussed disc herniation and SI joint issues several weeks ago. Um, I talk about how you can unlock your SI joint and help to relieve the piriformis syndrome there. 
Uh, but one of the keys, if you do have piriformis syndrome is, so would be to make sure the SI joint is moving well and to activate all those other little muscles around the hip that are responsible for keeping the femoral head centered on the acetabulum so that the piriformis muscle can relax and make sure that your glute is really uh, turned on well uh, and, and functioning. So what do you do if, if you blow a disc? You know, and, and you, it, 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 you hear one of my, one of my friends, uh, she it was the middle of the night, she got up to go to the bathroom. Uh, she had a little dog, her dog got under her feet. She stepped and kind of twisted so that she'd avoid uh, stepping on her dog and she sneezed all at the same time. So she sneezed and twisted and loaded her disc and herniated her disc and had acute horrible sciatica. And um, it's really a horrible pain. It's like a um, quite severe. And um, the good news is, is it generally does go away uh, within about six weeks. You'll start to feel, um, you'll feel better. Um, oftentimes you feel better lying down flat. Uh, and I recommend that you put uh, a pillow underneath your knees so that you're basically taking the stretch off the sciatic nerve. Um, but the literature is very clear uh, in demonstrating that rest for it really shouldn't be for more than 24 or 48 hours. Um, and I think that the key thing is, is that when you're moving around with an acute disc herniation, you've got to move properly. You've got to, you've got to biomechanically protect your spine so that you're not constantly aggravating the nerve mechanically, aggravating the disc mechanically, because really the key is to try to decrease the inflammation and decrease the load on the nerve acutely. The sooner that you can do that, the sooner the nerve can settle down. Um, I like using hot and cold contrast, particularly if you have got some muscle spasms uh, in, in the paraspinals in your lumbar spine uh, or, and also in your buttock. So you can apply the um, heating pad and then a cold pack um, and, and this can help to relieve some of your discomfort. Uh, I would talk with your doctor about getting some anti-inflammatory medication because when the disc herniates, there is often inflammation around the disc, which causes the nerve to be not only mechanically compressed, but irritated by the inflammation itself. So in this really acute phase, you really want to do anything and everything you can to take the mechanical pressure off of the nerve and to decrease inflammation around the nerve. So I recommend that people can go and get massage. You can if you very, I, I don't recommend massaging the nerve itself, but releasing the piriformis, releasing the hamstring muscles, releasing the um, muscles that um, surround the nerve and are potentially putting a little extra pressure in the buttock can help to take a little bit of pressure off the nerve so that it can, it can kind of relax and, and start to feel better. Uh, muscle spasm in the spine itself. Uh, sometimes people will have that acutely because the body is trying to prevent you from moving and flexing and stressing and loading the disc. So um, it's really important in this instance that you activate your core isometrically and involve all of the muscles of your core. And uh, we discussed this concept uh, in the previous session on, on back pain, but looking at the core as a box where you've got the pelvic floor at the bottom, the diaphragm, the breathing muscle at the top, the abdominals at the front, and then the back muscles at the back. You want to activate all of those muscles so that they're working together to protect your spine and move, twisting, moving like a log so that you're protecting your back and, um, and, and uh, the disc area to allow things to settle down. And I've, 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 I think that floating in a pool, not necessarily swimming, but even just lying there, uh, you eliminate gravity, you allow the muscles to um, relax, you take the load off of your spine, can be very, uh, very beneficial in the very early phases. So very common questions that I get is, uh, you know, I've got this horrible pain in my leg. Um, this is horrific. Do I need an operation? Um, do I need an injection? Uh, epidural injections, steroid injections? Um, and uh, when do I need an MRI and or an x-ray? Um, I'm going to start with the third one first. I think that everybody that's suffering from sciatica that's significant should be in at their doctor. They should get an x-ray of their spine and they should get an MRI. Uh, I think it's important to get an x-ray because uh, it'll tell you how much arthritis you have in your back. If any, uh, it may pick up other 
weird and wonderful things that um, you don't necessarily look for on the MRI. Uh, but the MRI really is the gold standard. And here you can see on the left, an MRI of the lumbar spine. This is the vertebral uh, body. We have the disc here and you can see a normal disc that is white and well hydrated um, here. And then at this level, you can see that the disc material has herniated into the spinal canal and is putting pressure on the cauda equina. So this helps us to determine the size of the disc, how much disc material is out in the spinal canal, is the disc material sequestered or not, and um, the specific anatomy of what nerve root is, is being press, uh, compressed by the disc material. Uh, fa it's fascinating to me, um, you know, when, I, when I went through my residency 30 years ago, anybody who had an acute herniated disc and any kind of motor sign, so if you lost a reflex and you had any weakness in your leg, was pretty well automatically uh, taken to the operating room and had a discectomy. Um, over time, I think that with waiting lists here in Canada, the waiting list got so long or it took so long for people to even get in to see the surgeon in the first place, um, we found that um, the disc material itself actually atrophies. So um, many of the spinal surgeons have stopped doing disc surgery uh, because the tissue starts to atrophy and um, take pressure off of the nerve naturally over time. Now it doesn't happen instantly. It, it does take time for this remodeling to occur, um, but it, it definitely uh, is something that we see on MRIs where you'll see uh, the disc herniation. And then two years later, you get a repeat MRI and the disc herniation has resolved. Um, the use of injections, I think that they can be beneficial if you've got a really irritated sciatic nerve that hasn't gone, that your symptoms have not started to diminish within six weeks. Putting some steroid around the nerve will help to prevent the nerve root from adhering to the disc material. And I think that that's an important thing during the acute phase. You want to try to keep moving because if you move, the nerve roots move and it prevents, um, I believe, some of the fibrosis or adherence of the disc material to the nerve root. If you get the, um, the disc material sticking to the nerve root, then that can be a really challenging problem and lead to some chronic pain. So um, an injection to decrease inflammation around the nerve root followed by gentle mobilization and getting going and getting moving is really important. So what is the role for surgery? Um, certainly anybody who has what we call a cauda equina syndrome, where you've got a large central disc herniation that presses on the nerve roots that supply your, your bowel and your bladder, uh, where you lose control of your bowel and bladder, uh, this, this is something that needs to be uh, managed um, very quickly. I remember um, when I was a, a resident at Toronto East General Hospital, uh, it was a Friday night and there was actually a big uh, party that night, um, all the orthopedic surgeons were going to, uh, it was a fundraiser and uh, I was on call. And my habit was that as I was leaving the hospital, I would always go down to the eMERGE and just see if there was anything there that um, anybody there that I might need to see uh, so that I wouldn't sort of leave the hospital, get home and then get called back. And that night around five o'clock, I walked in and there was a man who had an acute cauda equina syndrome. And uh, in those days we did myelograms, that was a long time ago. And uh, he had all the classic signs and symptoms. And so uh, Dr. Malcolm and I spent our Friday night in the operating room instead of uh, at the ball. But uh, uh, afterwards we went out and got some Indian food. So it was fun. But um, this really is important that you, that you deal with these situations um, quickly because the longer that there is pressure on the nerve roots, the less likelihood uh, for recovery. Um, loss of motor function. Um, is something in my mind, if I see somebody who has a large sequestered disc herniation and they've got a foot drop, um, I would probably lean more towards getting the pressure off that nerve root as quickly as possible to try and restore function. People will recover. And um, actually my friend that had the, the disc herniation, 
in the middle of the night did have a foot drop and I sent her off to a spine surgeon expecting that she was going to have, uh, um, have a discectomy. And he said, no, we don't operate on these anymore. So, you know, and, and she did recover, um, but it was not an easy process. Um, some surgeons are, are more aggressive when um, you've had pain for a long period of time. And I think it would have to be far longer than three months. Uh, I think that the pain would have to be um, more along the years um, standpoint, but this is a really controversial area. And in these situations, you know, you wonder where is the pain coming from? And I think that a lot of times people who have pain that don't, res that doesn't resolve quickly, they've probably got some fibrosis around the nerve root and going and doing surgery in this situation, I don't think is necessarily a good idea because you go in and you're removing scar tissue from around the nerve root and potentially a bit of disc material. But the fact that you're doing surgery could lead to the development of more scar tissue. So uh, I'm not a huge proponent of this. Um, and as I've mentioned, uh, the type of disc herniation, so sequestered disc um, fragments, which are really large uh, with uh, potential motor signs, I think personally are um, uh, an indication for surgery. Now, having said this, whether you have surgery, whether you don't have surgery, um, and, and actually the results from surgery show that it, anybody who goes and has the discectomy may get some relief of pain from that leg pain, but one or, you, one or two years down the road, they're in exactly the same position as someone who didn't have a discectomy. So if you can get through that horrible sort of six week mark to eight week mark, you're gonna be the same whether you have surgery or not. Um, so I think this is why most spine surgeons have become more conservative. Um, and, and then you have to think about, you know, why have I overloaded my disc? Why have I herniated my disc, whether you have surgery or not? And then we have to change how we're loading the spine so that we can prevent the disc from, and the spine from being overloaded any further. And this is where, uh, you know, where Eric and I are always emphasizing that we have to have a foundation for movement. So we need to make sure that we've got good alignment of our spine, that the vertebral bodies are stacked in, in um, the way that they should be, uh, that the muscles, the tendons, the ligament and the fascia are all balanced. And it's complex around the spine because there's so many little muscles and there's the whole circle. You've got the muscles at the front, muscles at the back and the sides that all have to be balanced and you have to be using the correct movement patterns. Um, And that is pretty well um, what I have to say today um, about this. So I, there is one book I'd like to recommend um, and it's Esther Gokhale. Uh, I'm not sure if I'm pronouncing her name properly, um, but G-O-K-H-A-L-E, uh, Eight Steps to a Pain-Free Back. Um, I think it's an excellent book and it gives you a lot of really good practical tips and tools of how to live your everyday life. So how do you sit properly? How do you lie down properly? How do you um, stand and walk properly so that you have the proper alignment of your spine? And um, she, she is not a medically trained individual, uh, but she experienced back pain and a disc herniation around the time of a pregnancy. And she had surgery and uh, the surgery wasn't really that successful. And uh, she had persistent pain and the surgeons were saying, okay, let's do another operation. And she's like, well, didn't really do it go so well the first time. So why am I going to do it the second? And she started to study cultures um, where people don't have as high an incidence of back pain uh, and disc herniations as we do in North America. And this is how she kind of came about her method, which really follows many of the principles of what Eric and I um, discuss, which is establishing a foundation for movement and uh, for your spine. So um, I'm hoping we have some questions. Yusuf, what's going on in the chat line? Oh, we, we certainly have questions. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Um, awesome. Yeah. Sciatica is tough. I've, I've been through it myself actually. And it's, yeah, that pain is terrible. Oh, isn't it a killer? It's, yeah. it, it, yeah. it really, it's hard to get comfortable and to, to figure, figure out what to do. And I, yeah. Yeah, for sure. Um, one question here, I think I'm going to hold off and, and push it off to uh, next week when both you and Eric are on. Okay. But uh, it was basically about, you know, one person uh, mentioned that they were teased when they were younger and made not 
not to feel good about their body. And I think they were talking more from a psychological, philosophical perspective, you know, the aspects uh, relating to their body, you know, um, getting some thoughts on, on that area. So I don't know if you want to make a quick comment now, and then maybe you and Eric can both talk about that. Yeah, you know, I th actually, I think that's a great idea, Yusuf, to, because I, I know Eric is going to have some really helpful insights. And, For sure. you know, I'm, I'm, I'm really sorry that you've had to experience um, that situation because, um, uh, you know, how we feel about ourselves and our, our body image are very, very um, connected. And um, Eric and I are going to, we're going to, we're going to talk about this and we're going to put some thoughts together to, to try and help you with this. Cause I believe that there's some solutions. Um, I think it's horrible that people are um, have to experience this kind of thing. And um, next week we're going to, we're going to give you our toolbox for how to deal with that. How's that? That's great. Um, okay. Next up is John. Uh, please. Could I ask the difference between active SMR and stretching on the body? If you have weak muscles, you're told not to stretch as it decreases muscle activity, but does ASMR decrease muscle activity? Okay, that's a really good question, uh, John. I like it. Um, so ASMR stands for active self myofascial release. And what you do with active self myofascial release is you apply pressure to a part of the body. Um, so let's say with piriformis syndrome, you've got a really tight piriformis, that muscle and the tissue around it and around the sciatic nerve may not be moving very well. So with active self myofascial release, what you would do is maybe apply a ball to your buttock around the piriformis. You don't wanna be right on the sciatic nerve, but you wanna to try to be beside it. And then what you will do is you'll sit there and then you'll actively move your leg. So you don't have a therapist moving your leg, but you are using your muscles to straighten your hip out and bend your hip up. And then you would actively externally rotate and internally rotate your leg. And what you're doing is you're pinning down some of the tissue, um, the piriformis and fascia that may be around the sciatic nerve. And by moving the other muscles, you're creating, uh, you're getting those muscles to slide properly. Now, if you were to just passively stretch your piriformis, so there's a pigeon stretch, pigeon pose, um, for example, uh, and you just lean into it, you may actually stretch more of the tissues around the fibrotic and tough stuff. So that is the main reason I like using active self myofascial release. There's no, um, there's no uh, evidence that active self myofascial release turns or shuts your muscles off because you're actually actively engaging the muscles as you're going through motion. And you're not just sort of hanging out in the maximal end range of the tissue, which you do do with a passive stretch. So I hope that answers your question. Yeah. That's great. All right. Um, I think Eric might be actually jumping in. Oh, awesome. Just going to give him a second while he does that. Um, let me just look at the next question for you. Oh, there he is. Okay, I'm going to let him in. Eric. There he is. Hey. 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 Hi, welcome, welcome. Thank you. Sorry, I didn't want to interrupt that question. No, oh, perfect that timing. So nice to have you here. Oh, okay. Um, <laughs> oh, Madalena's here too. Madalena's here. Mm -hmm. The team is here. Oh my gosh, He's welcome. Here. Where is Yusuf? I'm, uh, I'm not on video. Oh man. Yeah. Okay. I'm using my desktop today. Ah, uh, okay. Well, uh, I just wanted to invite the team here. Real quick, um, so just a little break for the Ask Dr. B Live for just a minute, everybody. But uh, today is Dr. B's birthday, so I thought oh. it would be cool to, to have the team here. I wish Yusuf was here, but he's here in, in voice. Um, just to wish Dr. Okay, B. I'm going to start crying. Just to wish Dr. <laughs> B a birthday. Um, so I think let's 
I'm a terrible singer, but I'm going to do it. Oh anyway. my God. Let's sing happy birthday, everybody. Okay. And you at oh, home, no. you, can, you can sing along at home. Oh, happy birthday, birthday to you. Happy birthday to you. Happy birthday, to you. You. Happy happy birthday, birthday dear Dr. Dr. Boynton. Mm. Happy birthday to you. Oh, I don't know how oh. that comes through on the live, but it doesn't matter. Well. <laughs> um, oh, you guys are awesome. <laughs> Oh, you're awesome. Thank you so much. So, uh, yeah, I just wanted to just say a quick thing and I want everybody to hear it, everybody watching to hear it. Um, it's just been oh. such an, a pleasure and an honor to, to have you uh, be a part of this thing that we're doing here. And it's oh. clear how much you mean to us and, uh, and to the world, like sharing what you've been sharing. I've been listening silently to this <laughs> presentation and it's, it's just amazing like how you put it all together and the knowledge and the experience and everything about how you present just the material and how you present yourself and so humble with everything that you've done um, with your career um, still having that that humbleness it's, it's just such an inspiration uh, so oh, thanks well. thanks for being you Dr. B and for <laughs> thank you you're for sharing cry. yourself <laughs> <laughs> and for sharing well, yourself with the world well well thank you so much I'm I'm so grateful to be part of uh part of our team here. It's, uh, you guys inspire me. And all I can say is I'm moving better now at 61 than I was a year ago at 60. And Eric, you have uh, a lot to do with that, um, with the exercises you've taught me. And um, yeah, I just, uh, it's really fun to be part of a team that's like-minded and wanting to help people to keep moving and having fun and doing what they love to do for many, many more birthdays. So thank you so much. Cool. Okay. Well, it's been awesome. Um, and Matt, use any quick words before you return to the Ask Dr. B live show? I'm bringing on my uh, my camera. Go ahead, Matt. Yeah, just um, I hope you're really enjoying your birthday and uh, it's been great working with you so far. Such a nice learning experience as well. I feel like I learned a lot. And uh, sorry for hijacking your presentation. <laughs> no, it's, it's very special that you've uh, taken the time uh, to say happy birthday. So thank you so much. And Madalena, you're great at what you do too. I love it. Madalena, she's oh, uh, fantastic at getting, uh, getting the kind of words out there so we can reach as many people as we possibly can. And, uh, and I'm learning from you. I love that. Um, oh, so thank, thank you. you. Thank you so much. I don't know if you can see me now. Oh, hey there, Yusuf, with your tan from being outside and being outside too much. Fishing. I love I it. I lost my beard last night. I was uh, cleaning it up, accidentally hit my mustache, and I had to take the whole thing off. Oh, no. <laughs> <laughs> so, happy birthday. Thank you so much for everything that you do. I think, um, you know, Eric, Eric said it. You're not just important for us, you're important for the world and all these people that you're helping. So, it's an honor for us to be part of this with you and help you help others yeah for well, sure i'm really grateful that you guys uh you do help me with this because uh it's my dream so you're helping my dream come true so yeah. thank you thank you everybody thank you yeah. all right guys well sorry for the hijack everybody listening but uh, i'm sure you enjoyed it dr beast <laughs> awesome probably so. won't be able to think i'm not gonna be able to say anything i'm so <laughs> uh so uh i'll, I'll try to chime touched. in I'll try to oh, chat in while you're recovering. Take a couple deep breaths. <laughs> go in the corner. Take a couple deep breaths. Actually, Eric, uh, we, I do have a question for you. We were going to push this sure. off until uh, next week. But since you're here, uh, this one came in uh, from a person that said they were kind of teased when they were younger about their body. And they don't really have a uh, – I guess they don't, they don't have a good relationship with their, their own body and their own self-image. Mm. And um, they wanted some – encouragement or thoughts on the psychological and uh, philosophical aspect of relating to one's body mm. from you mm. guys. I don't know if you want to hold off on answering it here and maybe have this as a part of next week. Um, okay. Yeah, I, I did. I did hear Dr. B kind of touching on that when you're asking this when I was just kind of coming in here. Mm -hmm. um, so yeah, th I think that would be good for, for Dr. B and I to circle back on that next week and and just kind of share. But uh, yeah, I mean, from my own perspective, um, I don't know if you've seen my, my back scar, uh, but previous to the back scar that I had, I had a big birthmark about 
maybe about that big on my back. And you can imagine as a kid, you got a big birthmark on your back. When you go to the pool, uh, you're teased. And uh, I've, I've experienced some, some teasing and some, I was very, very aware as a self, as a child. So I was very um, self-conscious about it. Um, I, I remember being like five years old and being aware and self-conscious of that. Um, so yeah, I, th- I think we could maybe talk about that next week. Maybe share Great. a little bit more about that. Cause that's, that's a, it's a deep question. So. You know, it really is Eric. And I think it's something that we even touched on a bit last week, which is, yeah. you know, learning to have that relationship with our body. And uh, you know, I, I, I think this, this is such an important topic and I'm really, really glad that um, it, that it's been brought out because there's a lot of people out there and it's just, I personally feel that we, we as a community need to be there to support one another and anybody um, in any way, shape or form, either the psychological and the physical parts of this. So let, let's do it justice. Let's do the topic justice. Yeah, yeah, and I think we right. did touch on it just with the when I, I I did where I'm leading towards my thinking right now, and I'm not going to dive into it. But the fitness industry has played a huge role in yeah. contributing to this problem. Uh, the fitness industry as a whole, where I mean, mar- in marketing, this the old saying is "sex sells," um, and unfortunately, that's selling fitness, movement, and exercise short. So I think we can talk about that uh, more next week. That would be great. Okay. Yeah. All right, cool. next question comes from Jeffrey, and it was a general question. Um, as we get older, why is there a tendency for muscles to stiffen and move in a smaller range? Okay, that's a good question, Jeffrey. I think that um, some of it depends on how active you are um, in the first place, but the less you do, the, um, the less you can do. And I was actually reading a study um, where there's there's biochemical changes when we don't move, there's a stimulus that um, is lost for the normal turnover of our muscle cells. So what happens, it's called um, autophagy, meaning that you go in and you remove the damaged part of a muscle. And as we get older, the ability to remove the damaged part of the muscle can become less. And then you get this stiffness. Shortening, I think, uh, is probably more to do with just not using the muscles and taking them through their normal range of motion. Um, but this is a, there's all the way from the bio, uh, biochemical and microscopic level up to the macroscopic level, changes that occur if you stop moving. So, um, Eric and I really wanna, we talk about movement longevity. And we want to keep people moving despite the fact that they're getting older. And myself personally, um, I feel that I'm moving better. My muscles are longer, stronger than they were certainly five years ago. Uh, but I even think in the, I even think since COVID, since I've barely been working on getting a good foundation for movement. So it's important that you keep moving and I would do the movement screen on the realm coach to see where you're lacking your mobility and, uh, and start doing some exercises because you can change that. You can remodel those, that body, you can, you can remodel your body. You can uh, improve it. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I would completely echo that. Um, The, the phrase that comes to mind, one is use it or lose it. That's number one. Mm -hmm. If you're not using it, you're going to lose it. In all these funny ranges and the exercises you'll find in Rom Coach or in my courses or on the YouTube channel, um, that you know, the exercises that we publish are targeted towards the neglected muscles and movements. Uh, so they're those are the ones that you'll, you'll find really challenging if you've been just doing the basic stuff. Maybe especially like for example, runners. If that's all they do, you think of that motion of running. It's in this kind of pretty much you're moving in only one plane of motion you're going to lose all the other ranges, the rotation, the abduction, all that stuff. And then when you go to do it, it's going to be really hard. And you're going to be very limited. It's because you haven't used it. You've just been, your body is adapted to what you do uh, regularly. So there's that. And then there's just, as we get older, I mean, elasticity of tissues and recovery goes down uh, naturally just over time. So um, because, I mean, we're all going to, 
die eventually. So <laughs> um, that's just on the path towards that. But by using it and moving, we are going to prolong our ability to move through a full range of motion. So that's just the, uh, yeah. I'm, I'm pretty basic in my thinking though. I don't go too scientific in that. It's just use it or lose it. And if you haven't used it and you start using it, it'll start to improve and you'll have, you'll have lots of um, range to gain because it's so neglected, you'll make pretty good gains uh, early on. Now, I, th I, I think that's fantastic and um, agree 100%. And also, I think if the older we get, the likelihood that we've had some pain somewhere in our body at some point uh, is higher. And very often, you know, uh, out there in the medical world, is that when you have pain is to stop doing things. Mm -hmm. And so people tend to stop and then they, 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 the, the less they do, the less they can do. And so this is why Eric and I are really trying to educate everybody that it's not stopping moving, it's change how you move. And, and it's amazing what you can do. It's, it's so fun. That's what's really fun about it. Yep. Great. Okay, next one, actually, uh few people are interested in this one, including myself, and it's uh, from Patrick. Will taking a collagen supplement help heal a disc herniation? And I think, you know, the other general question that came in is just supplements in general for these issues. Mm -hmm. The evidence with uh, taking collagen supplements is it's, in my mind, it's so hard to control all the variables and the factors. Um, I think that you have to have a good diet. You have to be sure that you're providing the building blocks to your body to um, go in and heal the area that's injured. You know, I think that when you eat collagen, very often what happens is that you take it in a supplement, the body then breaks that all down, then they absorb all the different parts of the collagen, and then whether they make a new collagen molecule with that amino acid or they make some other kind of protein, I don't know. I don't know the answer to that. Um, I don't think that taking collagen is going to hurt you uh, if you have tried it and you're feeling better. Uh, I don't know whether that's because of the collagen or because of a placebo effect or what it is, but I'm, I'm far more of a proponent of a really well-balanced diet um, and avoiding the things that we know aren't good for you, like processed food and sugar. Eric, what do you think? Yeah, yeah, I think I, I, we got to record the, the supplement reply to these types of questions, because it's pretty much the same to most questions. It's your, your diet and the way you move are going to be like your 90 to 95% in terms of what effect you're going to have on whatever joint, whatever tissue diet and the way you move and recovery. So sleep, mm -hmm. if you're sleeping yep. one hour a day, uh, one hour a night, then good luck on healing injuries. Yep. Um, but then the supplement may or may not contribute to the five to 10%, to five to 10%. But by that time, if you do the other things, you get to 99, 90 to 95%, you're likely not going to even need, or you wouldn't even consider the supplement because it'd be out of pain and you'll be, you'll be feeling good. Um, so that's, that's the standard, our standard reply to, to any supplements. I, just a, a side note on supplements, actually. So I, I've mentioned before, but I fall into the supplement trap of, okay, there's this new supplement. I'm going to try this <laughs> thing. So I was doing some Me research. Too. You do? Okay. So oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. Um, yeah. I've done them all. <laughs> <laughs> totally. Um, so there's, I was doing some research for the neural, the functional neurology stuff, the neural flux stuff that I, I do with Daniel, Daniel Gallucci. Mm -hmm. Some of you guys watching me may have seen that stuff. Um, but I was doing some research and I came across this, uh, nootropic. So basically helping concentration, memory, those types of things. That's the field, the subset of supplements is nootropics. It's for the brain. And there's this supplement stack is with your morning coffee or with caffeine, and I drink morning coffee. So uh, with caffeine, you take ginseng and L-theanine, these two supplements, and that's supposed to help. They're supposed to work synergistically to boost um, neural performance. So in, in my work day. So I was taking, I took that for maybe two months because I bought a couple of bottles and they come with you know, 100 pills or so. So I was taking it and uh, didn't notice anything really. Uh, I 
typically don't have issues with focus and, and work, um, work performance during the day, uh, as long as I've slept. But I didn't notice anything. And then maybe three, four weeks ago, I started, I felt this weird pressure in my head that I've never, ever felt before. And it was concerning because I don't get headaches. Like I, I can't remember the last time I've gotten a headache. And then this was happening for off and on randomly throughout the day, this weird pressure like deep inside the brain. Um, so it was really concerning because I've, I've got some family history of stroke. Um, so I was like, oh, very worrisome. I stopped taking the supplement because I, I was looking through my day and my diet, so nothing was changing, changed. I stopped taking the supplement just as a test because I, I know why I started taking that was for brain stuff. And lo and behold, haven't had one of those pressure head, like they stopped pretty much the next day or the second day after. And I haven't had one since. Um, and I have not changed anything else outside of that. Been drinking the same amount of beer, been drinking the same <laughs> amount of coffee. Like, so um, yeah, so I think the, the takeaway from that is just, they're not always inert in terms of there's no side effects, just because things are natural or they're, you know, you find them on the shelves at the grocery store, doesn't mean they're completely safe. And I think especially when combining these things. Um, so just a, a kind of be aware of the effects of these things, you know, they're not proven to help. Like, it's not like you have this proof that is undoubtedly this thing is helping with, you know, collagen is helping with knee joint uh, tissue repair. It's not um, bulletproof, but then the side effects, who knows, because they don't do really comprehensive. It's not like drug trials where they're, they, the side effects are really clear and it's like, 52% of people who take this experience this side effect. Uh, supplements don't go through that rigor. Uh, so just be careful. Because uh, this thing, if I had kept taking this, who knows what would happen? Because a pressure in the head, that's not something, uh, <laughs> I don't know, long-term, if I was taking this, uh, who knows? It could have, like, I'm in, this isn't fact, but I'm just thinking that could lead to stroke. I mean, that's that's not that's something to, uh, to take lightly. So just uh, uh, the other side of supplements. They're not all safe. Yeah. Okay. Um, we've got a few more questions here. One from Robert Cruz. Um, he's got a six millimeter disc bulge L4, L5. Hips all are also bothering him. Waiting on cortisone shots. Pain is daily. Uh, he needs something for long-term relief. Considering surgery to cut the, bul the bulge off and wanted to know what you guys think. Uh, Kaiser hasn't been much help. Uh, he's 39. He's had issues off and on for years. Not sure how it started, but it's not getting better. Okay, well, maybe I'll jump in with, um, so a disc bulge, if you remember the, if you, I don't know if you were here for the presentation, but there's that picture of the progression of um, how discs degenerate. And a disc bulge is actually, I consider a normal, a normal, um, a normal thing that happens if you were to look at people before uh, in the morning and at night. Now, if it's a six millimeter bulge, then there may be some asymmetry to the bulge. So it's more, it's starting to protrude through the annulus. But in this situation, the surgeon would actually have to damage the disc and open the annulus to go in and remove that material. I would not recommend that. I 100% would not recommend that. I, um, and I think that the key here is for you to understand how it is that you move that overloads your spine and is creating this disc degeneration, if that is even what is causing your pain. Uh, I don't quite have enough information to know whether it's the pain is coming from your back or if, it, if it's coming from some other uh, a muscle or from the hip itself. So um, I would be getting onto um, uh, the spine control and hip control program in tandem. I think that they're very powerful together. Um, and it, you know, if you just do one exercise here, this is the concept from the magic bullet situation. You need a program, it's been going on for a long time. Eric has organized this incredibly well and um, he'll progress you through it to allow your disc to, um, to heal so that the tissue, uh, you take the load off of the disc and at least prevent the disc deterioration from progressing. That's the goal, because if it doesn't progress, fantastic. And then you increase the tolerance of the tissue to be loaded. Um, so it's 
teaching you how to move properly. And I would do like spine control Monday, Wednesday, Friday, and hip control Tuesday, Thursday, so that you've got 20, 30 minutes of exercise that you're going to do to change how you're loading your spine. Yeah, and Robert just mentioned that sitting really hurts him. Yeah, and that and that's pretty typical. So, yep. um, Eric, what would you like to add to that? Yeah, I think the the age thirty nine male who's and sitting um, flares it up. That's pointing towards flexion dysfunction. So, the disc is bulging probably posteriorly. The bulge is pushing out towards the back. So the posterior part of the disc is damaged and might be lateral one way or the other um, or middle. Either way, it's posterior disc bulge, consider it flexion dysfunction. So on top of what Dr. B said, take a look at any other act movements and activities of daily life. Uh, so if you're sitting a lot, you've got to get a lumbar support, number one. If you have to sit, you have to sit with a lumbar support so your spine is in at least neutral. So a neutral position of the lumbar spine is a little bit of extension, a little bit of lordosis. If you're sitting slumped in flexion, that's just going to put pressure on the already damaged tissue. So it's going to further damage it and it's going to be irritated. It's going to stay inflamed and it's going to hurt. Uh, so that's number one. Whenever you sit, you need a good lumbar support where you got that you're up tall and you're in either neutral or even a little bit more extension. Now, sitting, you're going to have to get up regularly, stand up. Even if you just stand up, that's good. But if you stand up and you just reach to the sky, that's going to put you in a little bit of extension. And this is as long as it's not, um, you're not really, really acute. But if you reach up to the sky, it's going to put you into a little extension that'll help to centralize that disc. So the posterior bulge is going to put pressure on the back between, I'm just doing random things with my hands. I got to do it better. So these are your vertebrae, the disc is in between. So this is the back of your body, this is the front of your body. When you stand up and you go into extension, your vertebrae go like this, and it pushes that bulge back into the middle. Um, it can. So as long as it's not causing some kind of acute, really acute pain, it's flaring it up a lot. If it just feels a little uncomfortable, that's completely normal because you're putting pressure on already damaged tissues. But as long as it's not sharp, acute pain, do that, and it's going to help to normalize the disc. So sitting, get up every 10 to 20 minutes at least. Um, and when you do sit, sit with the lumbar, lumbar support. And then if you're doing exercise, uh, if you ride a bike, that puts you into that flex position. Uh, you're gonna have to sit up more, more upright. You might have to change your saddle, change your handlebars. Um, walking is really good for you. So walking, get your arms swinging. That helps to pump the fluids up in, in that tissue, helps to restore that uh, centralization of the disc. And then if you are exercising, I'm not sure if you are, but you got to look at what exercise you're doing. But the principle is it's got to be neutral spine for sure. So if you're squatting and you don't have good hip or and or ankle mobility, you're going to go into butt wink, which is going to flex your spine and it's going to put damage on the discs. Same with deadlifting. So you got to look at your exercises and just think, okay, I got to be neutral spine all the time right now, especially during that acute phase and probably for the next three, four, five months, six months even. You might be in neutral spine all the time. That's your mantra. Once you've stabilized, you've been out of pain for months, a couple months, then you can start to build up the tolerance of that tissue. But, and that's what we introduce into phase two of the spine control course. Excellent. It's great right. advice, Eric. Thanks for that, guys. Uh, next up is Colleen. Um, again, L4, L5. She actually blew it up, uh, her disc from sneezing. She was kind of embarrassed to tell people that. I've actually done that before, hurt my oh. back from a sneeze. It's so common. It's so yeah. common. Yep. Um, so she's been suffering for over two years now. And yeah, it's really had an impact on her life. Uh, losing insurance, can't really work. She's tried uh, physiotherapy, chiropractic adjustments, injections, and nothing seems to be helping. And before injuring her, her back, she was doing well, had a great diet, cooking her own food, but now she can't really stand for long. Um, any, just any general advice for, for Colleen here? So I'm wondering, Colleen, if you get any relief temporarily even with some of those treatments um, is one thing. Um, 
you know, I'd probably need a little bit more information about sort of your overall alignment and, um, uh, but I think, I think actually doing the spine control and going through Eric's little assessment so that you, you know, figure out, is it, you know, flexion or extension problem and, and doing his program and taking your time and going slowly. And I think one of the things that's so challenging is when you have the pain and um, the psychological aspects of this are really, it can be really debilitating because you get low because you feel like there's no solution. First of all, I do believe that if you can, if you can engage in the program and change how you move, that you will get better. So that's one thing that even if you've had pain for a very, very long period of time, if you uh, see yourself getting better and stick with the program, you will notice a massive difference. Even every couple of months, you won't, may not be normal for a year. It may take you a year or longer because you've had the problem for such a long time, but um, there is definitely hope. Mm -hmm. um, I would be curious, maybe Colleen, if, have you had any imaging? Uh, but from your, from your one comment about standing, that leads me to believe that's just one clue, but it leads towards extension dysfunction. So when you're standing, your lumbar spine is in a little bit of ex more extension, especially if you have some kind of uh, pelvic, anterior pelvic tilts. If you tend to be in an anterior pelvic tilt, when you stand, the anterior pelvic tilt gets more pronounced, which puts the lumbar spine into more extension. So it could be related to a disc, could be maybe some kind of, I, I would doubt it from, C what do you think, Dr. B, like a spondy? A spondy? Could be, or it could just be that the, her facets are really aggravated. You know, the yeah. whole, it, it, and this is where it can become very challenging. You know, is it the disc? Is it the facet? We almost don't care what it is. Yeah. So long as we figure out what it is that really aggravates your back. So what movements really aggravate it? And it sounds like you're in this situation where everything's aggravating it. Uh, in fact, Eric and I tomorrow are going to put together a little video series. Mm -hmm of some things that I think will really help you. So it's gonna be a few weeks before they're out, but it's sort of the intro to the spine control. When you're in a situation where everything and every, anything and everything you do hurts, you can start at square one where you're just trying to get a foundation for movement. So you need to try and relax the tissues around your spine, around your hips and your core. We're gonna teach you how to do that. Then you're going to turn, learn how to turn on all the appropriate muscles isometrically so that you're not actually moving, but you've got a neutral posture and you're learning to get the muscles turned on and working and then sort of building on that and putting it all together so that eventually you're doing the spine control course. Um, that's the, you know, because the, the goal is, is that you have to be able to build your foundation for movement, which the spine control course will do for you. Yeah. And I, I think I just have been reminded of the one, the one thing that you had to, uh, that I learned from you about when somebody is in pain and they're focused on it a lot, that area in the brain really, really grows. And then yes. they become more sensitive to anything that's going on there, which kind of leads them to often not move as much, which yes. gets that cycle continuing. Yes. Um, so how, how would you recommend somebody who's been in pain and now it's been, I think two years for Colleen, but, that area of the brain is probably brain is probably huge. Like she knows yep. what hurts, and it's quick to come on. The pain's to come on. So, how would you you approach that? Well, I think that's a great question, and I I, I think that it's really getting an attitude of okay, I've gone to the doctor. <clears throat> excuse me, I've been checked out. <clears throat> excuse me, I know that I'm okay. It's I've got some wear and tear in my body, and that I'm not going to die. I'm in pain and the pain is a message telling you that you're overloading a part of your body. So you're overloading a part of your spine. We know that, but what Eric is describing is when the brain gets involved, it actually makes you much more sensitive to it. So it, it, it uh, makes the pain more intense. So what you need to do is start talking to yourself and changing the story okay, I'm not going to get better. You need to change. Okay. I'm going to come up with a solution of how I'm going to get better. Uh, I now have a plan. I know that I've got some degenerative disc disease, but many people um, learn to change how they move with degenerative disc disease to become pain-free. And you see yourself, you see the, you see, you see uh, yourself getting better. 
And, you know, I'm, I, I take it as far and I've taken it as far with people that want to. Uh, and um, I used to use this technique with athletes uh, in particular because they know how to use visualization. So when you're visualizing where you're going to throw a ball or um, I teach people to visualize the tissues healing, the inflammation decreasing, the uh, fibrosis decreasing, the spine getting strong. And this is a very powerful thing that if it, that, that it's very common um, in Chinese medicine, actually, where the Eastern philosophy where you, you can lie down and you can use your breath and you can see yourself getting better and you have to, you develop a positive mindset because there's a lot of evidence out there now that we are what we think. And um, there's a book, Biology of Belief, by uh, John uh, Lipton. It's fantastic. So um, it's dealing with, um, when we talk about sort of the four R's, the relax phase is relaxing not only the mind or the body, the, not, not only the body, but the mind. So it's really, really hard to do when you're in pain, Colleen. And I, I'm not belittling your pain in any way, shape or form, but it's just trying to give you a tool to deal with this so that you're, you put it into perspective and if you're going to be in pain, we want to teach you to be in pain and move properly so that the tissues can remodel and heal. And the goal would be for that pain to diminish significantly. And I, I think one thing to add there is the, the understanding of once you kind of understand what are the movements that might be a little bit irritating, but I know they're not damaging mm -hmm. and getting through that. I think that's so important. Um, it's true. Having a yeah. safe, a safe zone. So what is safe to do and what not safe to do? I agree. Mm -hmm. And most, like all the exercises that, most of the exercises early on in the spine control course, they're, it's very unlikely that they're going to be damaging. Um, but I think what we're, Dr. B and I are going to put together tomorrow and publish uh, as soon as possible uh, those are even a step below that in terms of these are super, super safe. Like you're activating muscles when there's no movement of a joint, when you're just activating muscles mm -hmm. around a joint, it's called an isometric con muscle contraction, but those are so safe. Like you can isometric the hell out of <laughs> most things <laughs> yes. and not much damage is going to happen um, unless it's just like, at, you know, hanging by a floss, a thread of floss, um, like a tissue, but that's probably not your case. In most people's cases, you end up seeing us and following our stuff so uh the mindset piece is is huge for i think the chronic if you've had chronic pain for months and months and years uh getting that as well as knowing the safe zone and getting those exercises that you know are going to be okay even if they're a little bit irritating because the tissue's irritated and you've been sensitive to it for a long time um but to, to be able to uh push through push through that part um, that's a, a huge hurdle for, yep. for people. Right, it is, isn't have, it? Uh, oh, sorry, go ahead. Go well, ahead. I was just going to say, uh, sorry, uh, Yusuf, but, you know, Colleen, when you get in a situation where you have financial stress because you're not working, mm. uh, you haven't got the insurance to pay for the treatment, uh, you know, it becomes very, very stressful. So this is where you need to really sit down and I hope you have some family members or somebody that you can kind of make a plan and write it down, make it real, you know, that, the, the, these are the these are my my mantra that I'm going to tell myself to become positive, and and make a little plan. And maybe your family doctor can help you with this if if you know nobody else. But um, well, and we're here too. <laughs> you guys yeah. have almost got Colleen in tears here. Um, so it's it's great advice from both of you. She did mention that she's gotten a CT and an MRI before, and that um, steroids. Uh, provide some relief. So do you want to maybe address steroids at all? Um, so the, they, they may provide some temporary relief um, by decreasing inflammation around the joint and the spine and the, the nerve roots. Um, so that's a positive thing in a way that, that um, and it tells me though, that if you, if you don't change how you move after you've had that injection, then you just keep overloading the area and the inflammation can recur or the degeneration can progress. So um, this is something that um, I, I, I wouldn't be recommending a lot of injections. I wouldn't be recommending surgery. I would be recommending mindset 
and a, a, a plan for changing your physical movements. Um, and, and I think that that will really help you. And most of the time people start to feel better once they've got a plan. And, and once you get the muscles activated, as Eric has described in a safe way, it's very often you'll find that you feel better after you do your exercises. And that as soon as you start getting more pain, you'll go and you'll do a few of your exercises to turn the muscles on again, you'll feel good. Then you go about your business of the day and things start to get a little you know, painful again. You stop, spend five minutes doing the exercises to make sure they're turned on. And you'll find that that period of time where, um, where you're pain-free will get longer and longer as you get stronger and your muscles and your body is figuring out how it's supposed to be moving again. Everything's all discombobulated right now, Colleen, but there's hope. All right. Thanks, guys. Next up, we have Jay uh, suffering with nerve pain in, into both legs on and off for years. Got really bad lately and now considering getting a spine fusion. Two herniated discs with stenosis and bone spurs at 31 years old. He's a law enforcement officer and thinking his career is most likely over if he gets the fusion. So. Well, that's a tough one for sure. Yeah. Um, I'm wondering if you've done any kind of remedial exercises ever for your back um, and what you've done, you know, to, as a precursor to, to try to help. Um, but uh, I think that all the things that we've talked about uh, with Colleen would apply to you as well. Um, and uh what do you think, Eric? Um, well, I, yeah, I can't really comment on the fusion, but how, how old is? 39, I think he's. Uh, he is. 30s? 31. Oh, 31. Oh, wow. Even younger. Okay. Yeah. Well, uh, let me. There's but, tons of hope. <laughs> yeah. Before, before, and before you run into a, do, do a fusion, uh, you know, in this situation, when you've got two disc herniations uh, and some stenosis, it sounds like this is probably a congenital stenosis, like you were born with a slightly smaller spinal canal. So you're predisposed to any little increase uh, or, or actually decrease in size of the spinal canal. So it's really critical that um, you've got all your muscles activated and working and doing their best to uh, not overload your spine and your discs. Uh, and I would, I would avoid surgery for as I, I probably would never even do surgery in, the, in a situation where you've just got degenerative disc disease. Um, the, the basically going in and preventing that segment of the spine from moving then leads to increased stress on the joints above and below the area, and then they wear out. And so it buys you a bit of time, but I still believe that if you are able to establish the foundation for movement, and follow the spine control program that you would be able to be a police officer and do your job and live a really healthy and active life, despite the fact that you've got the, the changes that you do on the imaging studies. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and I, I mean, this question is similar to the, the first kind of question, I think it was from Robert, in terms of taking a look at activities of daily living, so work work activities. So if you're sitting in the cruiser all day, same thing. You got to be sitting in neutral spine. You got to be able to get up and move around if possible. Um, might be less possible if you're on the job like that. But if you're sitting in the cruiser, you got to adjust. Car seats are the worst. Car seats are designed like buckets to, and they put you in the fetal They're position, horrible. essentially. Like I've, I've thought every time I get in my car, I think about why hasn't somebody designed a properly I'm design with you. a car seat with just a little bit of extension in the lumbar area because that's what we need. Um, and then forward head, that's something that's going to cause repercussions down the spine. So head's got to be on the headrest. I mean, I'm super conscious of it and I still have to do it all the time because once you lose your attention and you start to focus on maybe driving, which is good, but you got to focus on <laughs> somewhere else, then the head will start to jet forward. And then it's just, okay, at the stoplight, okay, head on the headrest, there we go. That's gonna help have repercussions down the spine. So thinking about those activities of daily living, the positions you're in on a daily basis, that's gonna be really important for you, Jay. Um, and then 
he's Jay is saying he's done PT, Cairo, Stuart, Dr. McGill's methods, big three exercises, I'm sure, McKenzie method, injections. So he's done a lot. Um, but, and he's saying he's got to, oh, this is somebody else. But this, this is the situation where I think, you know, consulting with Dr. B would be a really, really good idea. Um, because her, just the, the approach is, is very holistic, uh, as I'm sure you can tell from the discussion that we've had so far. So this is something that uh, maybe you see, throw the link in, in the chat there. But yep, on it. yeah, this is uh, where you can move forward with confidence because you have a holistic approach. Something like the McKenzie approach, for example, I'm pretty familiar with, but it's, it's very rigid in terms of this is kind of what everybody does. Um, so, and the progression, uh, it's limited in terms of, you know, it's not looking at what the hips are doing. It's not looking at what the knees and the feet are doing. Uh, so it's limited from a holistic perspective in terms of just looking at the body. You've got to look at the body from a holistic perspective, especially with these long-standing issues. Mm -hmm. You've got to look at that other stuff, the other joints, because they all, over time, they will affect every joint has the capacity to impact every other joint if left, if it's dysfunctional, if left long enough. Um, that's just the way the body works. So, yeah, I, I would highly recommend um consulting with Dr. B on this one because yeah, you know why. <laughs> um, well, well thanks, Eric. And, and you know, I agree with everything you've said. And also I found like I, when I'm sitting for long periods of time, um, I find it really helpful to do the, the slumpy psoas activation technique that you use. Um, mm -hmm. Because I, I think that when the psoas shuts off when you're sitting, um, so when you're in your police cruiser, uh, check out, check out uh, Eric's uh, psoas activation um, live video. He teaches how to do the, um, the slumpy psoas activation. And you can do that, you know, a couple of times an hour, just when you're sitting there. And, yep. um, and that can help just to, to, to turn muscles on that need to be on so that it keeps your back healthier. Yeah, for sure. Right. That one you can search, search psoas. And I, I definitely show it in the, I showed it in last week's live, I think, or two weeks ago. But if you search SOAS and look for the live workout session, the mobility strength live session that is on the SOAS, then that's in there as well. Okay, I'll post some links up. Uh, next up, we have Nanny, who's, uh, we've had a few people actually ask about uh, your, like where your clinic is, Dr. B. So I've, I've posted the consultation with Dr. B link. Okay, thanks, and um, I'm in Toronto. <laughs> Yeah, not sure if you wanted to mention anything else there. Um, Manny here says that she's got severe sciatic pain um, daily. The, the difference here between her question and the others is uh, she mentions that when one side eases up, the other side starts. The whole body tenses up, and the leg and calf muscles are very tight. Uh, 66 years old, and I guess this got worse when uh, she had a slip and fell a couple of years ago. And the doctor told her she's got herniated discs. Okay. Um, well, Nanny, because it's both sides, it could also be an element of this spinal stenosis where you have a slightly smaller spinal canal as well. Um, and what can happen is when you know one side's sore, you start using the other side and then you overload the muscles there and one, you, know, you kind of ping pong back and forth. Uh, and the, so the bottom line um, is really kind of following all of the principles that we've been talking about, um, which is, you know, understanding how your hips are moving or not moving, understanding how your spine is moving or not moving, and establishing that foundation for movement, looking at your positions uh, throughout the day, your activities throughout the day, and really focusing and understanding and gaining an understanding of what aggravates your back pain and what doesn't and then learning how to change how you load your back by changing how you move. So I, I don't think I have really too, too much more to add to this. It's a pretty similar kind of story that I hear um, commonly. And um, uh, Colleen and Jay and Nanny sort of all fall into this situation of having this long-term chronic issue 
with um, dysfunction of how the, the back is being loaded that creates pain. And I would say with uh, steno stenosis type conditions to, you didn't mention earlier, earlier but uh, decompression of the spine mm -hmm. can be pretty helpful. So uh, one simple method would be lying with your tummy over a stability ball and just letting your head relax and letting your hips relax. And that if you can imagine you're lying like this, that's gonna pull because you've got weight pulling from your head and weight pulling from your legs, your lower body on one side, on the other side, then that's just gonna pull the spine apart. And it's a safety compression as well because you're supported, uh, your, your spine is completely supported. So that could be helpful for the, the stenosis type conditions or the compressive issues. Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, next up uh, is Jay. Disc herniation L4, L5, L5 to S1 and disc degeneration for four years. Nothing seems to be helping. Um, he also asks if disc degeneration can be reversed. Okay. So, um, Jay, that's a good question. Uh, disc degeneration, it cannot be, um, it depends on how far advanced the disc degeneration is. So um, to actually have your whole disc remodel and have a brand new disc, um, once you've actually torn the annulus and the, and, and, the, and the nucleus has herniated out into the spinal canal, it's not likely that you're going to regenerate a brand new, you know, spanking new disc. However, um, I think that the annulus can heal, but slowly. Uh, its blood supply isn't great. Um, and you can induce changes um, in the disc by loading it correctly because the disc is made to be loaded. So the key is that by loading it appropriately, your, the cells will slowly reform an annulus um, the nucleus, uh, the, the, the nucleus itself may not be um, normal, um, but it, it at least will stop deteriorating. And, you know, I've been amazed, and I think this is, you know, a point we really haven't talked about today, but just because you've got a disc herniation or you've got a, a spinal stenosis or you have these findings on your x-ray, it doesn't mean you're doomed to having pain. So just because you have a finding on an x-ray, and an abnormality in the tissue doesn't mean that you're going to have pain in the tissue. So it's a sign for sure that you're overloading your body. And that's, that's why I use that information as, okay, I'm overloading this part of my body. So I need to change how I move. I need to change how I load that part of my body. And um, it will regenerate to a point, but it won't be normal, but it doesn't matter if it doesn't become normal. It will, um, get to a point where you can be pain-free and moving very well. And pretty much anybody probably over the age of 30 has degenerative, just some level of disc degeneration. Yes. Uh, as you, the older you get, the more disc degeneration occurs. And if you were to study a group of 70 year olds, there's way more disc degeneration than a group of 30 year olds. Um, but not everybody, some of them have pain, some of them don't. People with, you could have the same level of severe disc degeneration and one person has pain and one person doesn't and lives a completely normal life pain free. Um, so it's, and the reason why, one reason why is because the person is the way they move. The activities of their, their life, they're not putting themselves in um, those postures that are gonna cause further irritation on the spine, uh, but it's everything with, that we've talked about today. Mm -hmm. um, disc degeneration isn't the determining factor of pain, of whether you have pain or not. It's true. And, and you can have people that have relatively normal MRIs and have a lot of pain. So mm -hmm. the, the findings on the, on the x-rays, we don't operate on x-rays. We don't, you know, we, we use it as part of information, um, which is helpful for sure. Um, but it's not the be all and the end all. And I think a lot of times people focus when they hear, oh my God, I've got a bulging disc or a degenerative disc that it really um, takes their focus and they become very upset that, oh, I must have that addressed. I need surgery. I need something to deal with that specific issue. And to an extent, the answer to that, of course, is yes. But it's more of taking the information that what is the cause for creating that 
problem and how can we reverse that from a movement standpoint that I think is really critical. Yeah, it's structure versus function. So yes. structure is the body and that's, you know, got to be taken into consideration. But when it's movement, when it's pain, musculoskeletal pain, um, the function, the movement is, is where you're going to have the most, um, if you're going to address one or the other, if you're to address function, that's going to have a big impact on both function and structure. But if you look at structure and you only address kind of structure, which would be kind of through surgery, um, that's not going to really have an effect on function. That's why people who have surgery, Dr. B mentioned earlier, they come back two years later and it's the same problem. Um, so structure and function, you got to really put most of your energy on the function. How is my body moving? Not just the way my core and spine is, but everything else. How is the way my whole body is? How does it function? All right. Well, thanks for that, guys. Um, I think you've pretty much addressed everything. We do have a few other questions, but I, I, I feel like all the other questions that you've answered have kind of addressed everything that's left over. So I think we're ready to, to wrap things up uh, just for final comments. Cool. Um, well, yeah, I think the, the last one, the structure and the function, that's just uh, kind of really highlights where we come from, where our focus is, Dr. B and I. Uh, so how, it's how you move. You know, you've been moving in whatever way. It's fine. You've been moving in this way and it's got this result. But you can always, no matter where you are, you can always change how your body is moving and functioning. So it's, you think about it, forget about the past. Uh, just whatever info you had, sure, take it and, and make your decision. And then it's changing how you move. I echo that. Cool. Great. Okay. Yeah, finally, at the end, it's a pleasure to, to be able to celebrate your birthday with you on, yes. on Zoom here. With oh, well, thank you. Yeah, worlds. thank you. <laughs> I'm getting ready to go and have a little bit more fun. I had fun today. So thank you. And thank you guys for, uh, for your little celebration with me. I, I really appreciate that and uh, look forward to many more. All right. Thanks, everybody. Thanks, everyone. Hope to okay. see you next week. Ask Dr. B live Thursday at noon. See you then. Okay. Bye, everybody. <laughs>